Welcome to Virtual Humans Lecture 4.2, Vertex-Based Models. So in this lecture, we will see how to build a body model. And in particular, we will focus on the popular simple body model. The goal of this lecture is not only to understand how simple works, but rather to understand what are the important ingredients to build a good body model. So first of all, let's refresh our memories. By a body model, we mean a function that takes some input parameters. In this case, I told you that we chose the input parameters to be um, the shape and the pose of a person. So we want a function that allows us to control both the pose and the shape um, in a way that you, know, you can fix the pose, like you can see here, and you can vary the shape, or you can fix the shape and change the pose of a subject, or basically you can, um, once you've learned the model, you can generate any body in any shape um, in a way that looks realistic. And now here the input parameters are the pose and the shape. And some of you might question, why should the input be shape and pose? Why can I not choose some other input like, like height or H. Well, you can, um, but the shape and pose are some input parameters that are mm, very intuitive and that allow you to generate a wide variety of shapes. And you often want to control, for example, like the pose of a person without changing the shape. And so um, that's why it's an intuitive model. However, you could choose other input parameters. And there's models that, for example, like allow you to vary um, the weight of a person or the age of a person. Um, so this is something that you can build on top once you've learned a model of shape and pose. So in this lecture, we will use the notation of theta with an arrow to denote that it's a vector and to denote the pose parameters and beta with an arrow to denote that it's a vector to denote the shape parameters. And you will see many papers that theta is used for pose and beta is used for shape. This is because of, I think it comes from, from um, as early as the scape model used this notation and then following papers have followed on that. Okay, so now that we believe that pose and shape are a good set of parameters to control um, like the space of body shapes, um, the question is, all right, what kind of, function should I learn? How do I design my body model? We said, we're going to train the body model using training data of people, of 3D scans. Okay, fine. But what is our model for? Is it going to be a linear function of pose and shape that maps to body vertices? Or a polynomial function? So given that we have chosen a function, let's say polynomials, um, how do we fit these hyperparameters, these Ws, right? Um, using training data, right? So these are the input parameters and these Ws are the ones, the hyperparameters that need to be learned from data in order to minimize the, the model to data error. So what do you think? Do you think that linear is a good choice to map shape and pose linearly to vertices? Do you think that polynomials would be better? Well, neither would work very well. And the reason is that the articulation part of the transfer of the deformation is very nonlinear. And this part is very well modeled with rotations, which is what we saw in the second and third lectures. Okay, so we could do the following, like um, we could split the body into parts and uh, we could say that every body part is parameterized with a rotation and a translation. And this way, the pose would be a collection of rotations and translations for every part. Anyone can see problems with this. What do you think would happen? What could happen if these are my parameters? And I, for example, like optimize these parameters to fit my 
model to images or scans or IMUs or whatever observations I have, what could happen? Well, these parameters are independent of each other. These rotations and translations do not communicate to each other. So either I impose some constraints or what could happen is the following, like the parts could be flying all over the place, right? So I need additional constraints. One very effective way of imposing constraints is what we saw in the second lecture or, or the third lecture where we saw kinematic chains. So what is a kinematic chain? Um, essentially is parametrizing the human body motion with a skeleton uh, where every body part rotates relative to the parent part. And to obtain the total transformation, for example, for the lower arm, you have to accumulate the transformations of each body part until you reach the root joint of the body, right? This is the origin. So, um, and in particular in, in the simple body model and quite often in, in body modeling, like you, you parameterize rotations with exponential maps. You could also use quaternions here, but um, this is the choice made in the simple model and recall that to represent the rotation, you can use this axis angle representation where this um, omega here, this is an, uh, an scaled axis of rotation where the magnitude of the vector is the angle of rotation, how much you rotate and the, the unit vector of, of omega corresponds to the axis of rotation here, right? And remember that the rotation matrix, which is a three by three matrix that belongs to SO3 can be obtained in closed form using the Rodriguez formula, as you can see here, where recall that this um, matrices with a hat here, this is nothing else than this axis angle mapped into a matrix. This is the screw symmetric matrix. Okay, this is a three by three matrix. Um, and this here, the square means the matrix squared. Okay. All right. Um, and notice this sine and cosine take the angle of omega, which is a scalar. So this is a rotation about the origin, but in a skeleton, you have rotations about body joints. And so if you wanna rotate a point, let's say this point about a body joint, um, you need to do something else, but it's not much more complicated. So in particular, in the simple body model, all the, um, so what are called like the coordinate frames of every part are aligned at the beginning at the zero pose. Okay, so you, you might choose like the Z, X, Y axis for the coordinate frames and those are aligned, right? You have the same coordinate frame for the lower arm, for the upper arm, for the root joint and so on at the beginning. And now what you need to do is to track the changes. What is not aligned is the center. So each bone coordinate frame is centered at the joint for that particular joint, right? So this means that in order to rotate a joint, a point about a joint, you need to apply the following transformation matrix where the rotational part is the same. Like you have like this um, three by three rotation matrix obtained by the axis angle um, transformation. But now the translational part is essentially like this translation vector, which is which is the uh, the joint itself minus the parent joint. And so basically, this is the translation vector that basically moves us to the joint location. And so everything makes sense here because imagine that I'm um, transforming a body point into world coordinates. If um, if I would just have the identity, I would end up like applying this translation of the joint minus the joint parent, which basically would be rewriting the coordinates of this point in the world coordinates. Okay, so it's just a transformation, and um, and this transformation is local and it's mapping the. Um, it's basically it's writing the. Um, the point in body coordinates, it's writing it relative to the parent. Now, if you want to like 
accumulate rotations. You can do this with a kinematic chain, and we saw this in the previous lecture. And so essentially now a point in body coordinates PB would be transformed into spatial coordinates or world coordinates PS, accumulating the transformations first about um, joint two and then about joint one, okay? And so um, what might be a bit confusing uh, is that in the simple model, you should always think as like trans the transformations as a mapping between segments, whereas um, in a lot of literature of twist and exponential map, you think of transformations as a motion. Um, but I told you that you can think of um, rotations as a transformation between coordinate frames or as a motion. Um, you just have to be careful like um, what it really means to, um, to think in one way or another, okay? So here, like when you work with the simple model, it's always better to think in terms of um, transformation between parts, right? From child to parent and so on. Okay. So essentially now um, to define the full pose, we first need to define a set of joint positions, which are the bone, like the, the joints of skeleton of a body. So in particular, you will have K joints. Each joint is um, like the coordinates of a particular joint, like three dimensional. And basically this matrix J is the concatenated coordinates for these joints. Now, for every joint, you have one possible rotation, right? If you don't want to constrain the motion more. Um, and therefore, like you have that the theta here is a collection of axis angles, right? This omega 1 until omega k are the axis angles corresponding to each of the rotations about the joints 1 to k. So omega 1 here is a three vector, um, which is scaled by the rotation angle, right? So every <clears throat> every um, triplet of parameters here is basically a scaled axis of rotation. And so that's it. That's what defines the pose of a, of a character, right? Now, the question is, what do you think will happen if I apply a bunch of rotations using a kinematic chain um, to a template like this, which is divided into parts like this? Right, such that you know that part rotate according to J one and so on. Do you think that the parts will now fly all over the place? They won't, because just of how we constructed the kinematic chain, like we're we're constraining the motion to be ro purely rotational about each of the joints, except for the root joint where you have translation. Okay, so the the parts will not fly all over the place. That's good news, but what do you think could be a problem with such parameterization? I'm rotating every part with a rotation matrix um, and they will be connected, but what do you think could happen? Well, what could happen or what will happen is that like the, the, the mapping is very non-smooth at the transitions between body parts. So you will have a discontinuity whenever you jump from one body part to another. So you will obtain like some sort of Pinocchio um, kind of um, character where like the transformations, um, like the, the full transformation is not very smooth, right? Because here you transform according to one joint and here according to another joint. And so you have like a lot of articles. So it has been known in animation um, that you can deal with these effects to some degree using linear blend skinning for many years. So essentially now, um, instead of transforming every body part independent um, with a kinematic chain, right? Um, with this hard segmentation, what we're gonna do now is now smoothly deform the vertices according to a linear combination of transformation matrices. So whereas before a point was assigned either to one part or the other, now the points will be softly assigned to several parts at the same time. So for example, like this elbow point might be assigned with a weight of 0 0.8 to the upper arm and a weight of 0 0.2 to the lower arm in a way that um, this, um, this will turn this hard segmentation into a smooth segmentation. You can see these um, weights that associate vertices to body parts are like um, not a hard assignment, but this is a soft 
assignment, which is regulated by these so-called blend weights. So how do we transform a vertex now? Well, like now we have a summation from k equals one until big K. These are like the amount of um, body parts that influence a particular vertex. And basically then you multiply by these weights, which they should sum up to one and they should be positive. You, you linearly combine these transformation matrices for each of the joints and you multiply by the vertex. Okay, so if you isolate this vertex in the canonical pose, this bar here means in the canonical pose, this zero pose here, essentially we're having like a summation of K transformation matrices that we are linearly combining them, okay? You could think whether this makes sense or not. It leads to some interesting results, like it's, it solves some of the problems, but you can already argue you're linearly combining transformation matrices um, so it's not clear what the output um, will be, yeah. Um, because these matrices live in some manifold, right? For example, rotations live in some manifold. So if you linearly combine rotations, yeah, you obtain something that um, might not be a rotation. So, um, however, like the this. Oh, before we get to this, like, let me explain what are binding matrices because you might find this in the literature and this might be confusing. So the binding matrix is just one additional transformation that is needed because many times animators want to sculpt the characters on a pose that is not the zero pose. It's not the pose for which all the joint angles are zero, but it's just something that is called the skinning space where it might be a different pose and there the animators like make edits, manual edits, they actually change the shape of a character, right? Uh, to obtain the desired effect. And now if you have your um, linear blend skinning equations, then um, of course, if the vertices are edited in another pose, like it's not clear how to transfer this to a new pose, but it's not too difficult to do. What you can do is like, um, you essentially have to do two transformations. You want to take this point PSS, right, in the skinning space, and then first transform it into the zero pose, okay, which will be obtained with this inverse transformation matrix, GK of theta star, which is the skinning space pose, and minus one. So you have to first transform here to obtain TI, and then you can apply the GK uh, as we saw exactly as, as exactly as we saw before. So we have here this inverse transformation that goes to the zero pose and then another transformation to bring it to the pose that we're interested in, obtaining this um, TI prime, which is the transformed vertex. Yeah. So um, yeah, this is what these binding matrices mean. And this is something you have to deal with if your character is edited in a pose that is not the same as the zero pose. All right, so um, now that we know how to apply linear blend skinning, um, can you guess what problems we might encounter when we apply linear blend skinning to a given character to pose it? We're going to obtain something like this, which is an improvement relative to what we had before. Yeah, we had this, and now we have this. So notice how the creases here, all this unsmooth, unsmooth um, mesh, all these like discontinuities disappear, and now you have a smoother mesh. However, we are linearly combining these transformation matrices and we are applying them to vertices. So you're creating some artifacts as you can see here, right? Like this elbow, like it doesn't look very natural and so on. So, and also we didn't say how we have to, how we choose this, um, this blend weights. It's not clear how to do, like in animation, people do it manually. We'll see that um, it's much better. If you want to obtain realistic human bodies, it's much better to learn it from data. All right, so let's recap a little bit what, um, what standard skinning is. 
Um, so you start with essentially with rest pose vertices. You have to define what the joint locations are. You have to define what the blend weights are, which is the soft segmentation of vertices into body parts. And notice this matrix is N, which is the number of vertices, times K, which is the number of joints that can influence a vertex. It's a design choice, right? The maximum might be K equals to all the joints. All the joints influence your vertex. You might wonder whether this makes sense. For example, for an upper arm vertex, you might want to constrain that the only joints that affect these are the neighboring joints, right? The shoulder and maybe torso and maybe lower arm, but not the feet, yeah? And then you have the basically the pose parameters that control the pose of the character, right? And the pose parameters are tied to the joint, um, to the type of skeleton that you chose, right? Those two are together, yeah? That's why you cannot apply a pose from one skeleton to another. That's, a, that's not something you can do. All right, so the skinning function essentially like takes this set of parameters, the template, the joint locations, the blend weights and the pose, and it maps it to vertices. Okay, so um, that's good enough. Um, but again, we still have problems. Like, as I was mentioning before, we have like this, what are called in animation candy wrapper artifacts, um, which are making the joints collapse. And you can like, there's tons and tons of papers on how to like linearly, like how to combine transformations or how to um, transform meshes according to poses such that these artifacts are minimized. And um, one famous one is dual quaternion skinning, which reduces some of the artifacts, but it brings some other artifacts. And all of these methods are what you would call them like um, classical methods. They do not rely on learning, but rather they rely on a mathematical formulation that would reduce the amount of artifacts. Yeah? Another solution is to essentially like um, apply blend shapes. So blend shapes are just a set of vertex displacements that are applied in a rest pose. Right. So, for example, pose blend shapes would be like a matrix of displacements where you have here um, three components, one for uh, the displacement according on the X direction, displacement on the Y direction, displacement on the Z direction. And um, you have as many rows here as vertices in the model. OK, that's why the, why this matrix is um, um, n times three, sorry, this is like a little bit, um, oh, because this is vectorized. So this is um, a matrix that is vectorized into a vector of three times n, okay? So what do we mean by this? Like you apply some vertices such that, vertex displacement such that when I apply the articulated motion, the things will look fine again. So this is the trick. This is what you obtain with linear blend skinning. Not very good. Look that this doesn't look very natural, but with the proper vertex displacements on this canonical pose, right? Which might look unnatural in this canonical pose, but after applying transformations, the thing looks like a real human. And people have used this in um, animation and essentially like animators actually sculpt manually these blend shapes, this, which is a really tedious process. Right? And it does not scale to many poses and many shapes. So the question, of course, is how we can leverage training data. And um, in animation, this has been um, exploited to some degree. Um, so one approach is basically scattered data interpolation. So you want a query pose and you want to obtain like the blend shapes for this query pose such that you obtain like a realistic pose deformation. And you have a data set right, of previously sculpted um, blend shapes for different poses. For every pose, you have a different blend shape, as you can see here, which has been manually defined. And then for the query pose, the question is like, how do you use this training data in order to obtain your target blend shape? What do you think you would do here? Well, you could use your favorite machine learning algorithm. The easiest that you could do here is do some sort of... Um, um, nearest neighbor, you find the closest poses, and then we, using a kernel, 
um, that says that basically if my target query pose, um, which is theta prime here, is close to my training data pose, this weight should be high and otherwise it should be small. That's why we have this exponential and this minus here, so it will decay quickly. And so in the end, you obtain that the blend shape for the target is a linear combination um, with these lambda i's of blend shapes in the training data set. Okay, so this is using some learning, but again, like all this training data has to be um, previously sculpted. So what, it, what the problems are that this is computationally very expensive because you need to find the closest poses, you need to manually sculpt these things, and um, it doesn't extrapolate very well to novel poses, right? Uh, because you're using this, um, this, this scattered um, um, interpolation. So if we don't use scattered data interpolation, like how do we define the pose blend shapes? And again, how do we set all these parameters? How do we find the template in the rest pose that represents like some sort of average of the humans in a population? How do we set the joints? In which location should they be? And how do we set the blend weights? How do we find this soft segmentation of vertices into body parts? It seems like a lot of tedious work to do, um, a lot of things to define manually. Also, how do we model shape identity variations? We didn't explain how to do this. Okay, so now I want to jump into this um, simple body model, which stands for skin multi-person linear model which essentially it builds on top of skinning, but you will see that all the components are learned from training data, okay? So simple is a function that takes pose and shape and it produces like a mesh of a person in that particular pose and shape. And what you can see here are not real people, but they are synthesis of the model. So the philosophy when simple was um, designed was to aim for the simplest model while having state-of-the-art performance. And um, I think that's a very good principle to, to pursue. And um, basically like this will make the training easier and it will be also like, because the model is based on standard skinning, it will be compatible with a lot of software packages that rely on standard skinning to animate characters. The trick will be to learn all the parameters of standard skinning from training data and how to do this efficiently. So essentially the simple pipeline is not very different from standard skinning. It adds a component in order to model the identity, which basically are the shape blend shapes. So essentially like um, we will learn like a set of vector displacements that model how people change in a population. And notice how the joints here are a function of the mesh such that when the shape of the person changes, the, the joints of the body also change. Then there's the pose blend shapes, which are these funky displacements applied on this canonical pose such that when I apply a given pose like this one, for example, um, like the mesh, the resulting mesh after applying the articulation looks realistic. Okay, so you can see here the pose blend shapes moving. Notice here how there's subtle deformations happening here such that the target pose um, looks like a real person, right? And what Simple is doing is learning like essentially all the components, how this shape identity should be modeled, how the joint should be predicted as a function of the shape and how this pose blend shape should be learned as a function of pose in order to obtain realistically looking uh, meshes. So essentially like we have that standard skinning is this function W which maps the template, the joints and the blend weights and the pose to vertices. Now simple is parameterizing skinning by shape and pose. So it's gonna parameterize each of component of standard skinning with beta and theta, okay? So now the template will be a function of pose and shape. The joints will be a function of shape, 
right? Make it intuitive, like our skeleton does not change with um, our pose. Or let's say the the I mean it does change, but it, it the 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 um, it changes only according to the pose, right? It doesn't change um, beyond that. Then you have blend weights, and then you have like the pose parameters, and then this will be mapping to vertices. So notice this is exactly the same. The only thing is that now we've basically parameterized these components. So essentially simple is skinning parameterized by pose and shape. So how does this work? Um, so essentially the template, we want to make it a function of pose. And to do this, we add like what are called the pose blend shapes. What are pose blend shapes? These blend shapes are these matrices which are vectorized, which are a set of displacements for the full body, right? So every PI, which is here a vector, will have dimensions 3n, right? So that it, it represents a full displacement field for um, the full mesh. Now, like um, this post blend shapes, like any blend shape, like it's it's a linear function. So like it's a choice. It's um, this this BP is a linear function of um, this blend shape. So it's going to be a linear combination of these different blend shapes PI. How do we linearly combine? Well, you could have some function of theta, right? Um, that maps to like it's it's multidimensional, and basically every dimension i will multiply one of the blend shapes. That's a design choice. What should fi of theta be? Well, the simplest possible choice is to say, well, um, I'm going to choose f of theta to be theta itself, the axis angle representation, right? Which remember, it's like these triplets, where every triplet is an axis angle for a given body part. What's going to happen if I choose this? Well, it's not going to work very well. Like, look, this is what happens at the um, at the neck. And notice, like, let me play this again. Like, this is after training the model using training data. I'm going to explain la later how to do this. But after learning the model, you obtain, like, um, a model that produces, like, such transformations on the neck, which is not great. And it's been learned from data. But just because we made a not very good choice of design, right, and our mathematical formulation, we cannot learn a very good model. So why does this happen? Well, first of all, the axis angle is tricky to work with. If we are having like axis angles modulating post blend shapes, the first problem that we see is that, first of all, it's very difficult to make these blend, these blend shapes symmetric, right? So it's very difficult to have like the same transformation applied when I like turn to the left or the right. Um, with this axis angle representation, right? Um, so if the neck rotates clockwise or anti-clockwise, it's um, because the axis angle will take a positive or negative sign, like these blend shapes will be positive or negative and the effect will be um, opposite to each other, right? On each side of the neck. Um, but also the axis angle are not bounded, right? Um, so this doesn't make it a very good um, choice. So you might have axis angles that make a lot of um, like basically like if you don't constrain them to be between 0 and 2 pi you might have like more than 2 pi um, during optimization and then basically like this is um, making the learning not very well behaved. You can deal with these things but it's, um, it's an additional thing to worry about. Um, so the idea is to consider f of theta as the vectorized joint rotation matrices. So now, like the blend shapes are linear in rotation matrix elements. So what does this mean? So we take f i of theta. So every triplet, okay. Remember, theta is this concatenation of axis angle representation. Now, for every axis angle, we recover the rotation matrix exponential of omega 1, exponential of omega k. And we subtract the identity. Can you imagine why we want to subtract the identity by looking at this equation? We want now that these um, 
BP is a linear function of rotation matrix elements. So every rotation matrix element will multiply one of the PIs. Why do we want to subtract the identity matrix here? Well, think what effect do you want to have when the um, theta is the zero pose? You have zeros. You will have all rotation matrices will be all identity. And for this configuration, you would like to have a zero pose blend shape effect because otherwise you would be starting with some, um, you would be compensating um, basically something when there's no pose. Right. So again, like this is another design choice that is important to make things work. You want that at the identity um, rotation, the contribution of post blend shapes is zero. Therefore, you have to subtract the identity here. And so basically, you can vectorize these rotation matrix elements, which are going to be nine elements per rotation, uh, which is denoted here as this exponential. And um, essentially, you will have nine elements for one joint and the second joint and so on. So in total, you will have nine times k equals 207 entries in this um, in this vector. And therefore, you will have 207 blend shapes, 207 PIs, right? This is, of course, an over-parameterization. You have lots of parameters here. But um, if you're careful how you learn it, like you will end up with a good model. That's what uh, as I will show next. All right, so now notice the difference between just choosing this axis angle representation or choosing this, um, making this uh, blend shapes a function of rotation matrix elements. Yeah. So this is something that I have not observed only uh, with a simple model, but also like training models that map um, like rotation matrix elements to something else um, usually behaves better than using the axis angle representation. And I think also it's because the rotations are functions of sines and cosines, and this also makes it bounded between minus one and one. And this is also, um, also good for learning, right? So that's this normalization um, um, for us. So now, how do we estimate the locations of the skeleton? How should I set J for a given new shape? Should I just scale? Just scaling will not work, right? What's the simplest thing that I could do? Well, you could um, basically regress the joints um, from the rest vertices, OK? So you can consider a matrix j which is going to be like the mapping that you want to learn um basically that maps from the vertices in the rest pose it maps to the joint locations so you need to find the joint regressor matrix uh, math call j here so this math call j multiplied because this is going to be linear like um, this matrix will take will multiply the rest vertices and it will output this joint locations in practice, um, you need to regularize things. So what is useful is to make this, um, this rotation matrix be sparse. This means that every joint location is predicted only as a few entries of the full vertex uh, mesh. Yeah. How do you make the matrix sparse? Well, you can include sparse regularizers like um, L1 on the matrix elements, this will push a lot of numbers to go to zero, which is desired. So what you can see here are these lines that in indicate which vertices are most active to predict a given joint location, okay? So also another regularization that is used in the simple model is to force the um, this sparse rotation matrix, this sparse um, joint regressor matrix to, um, resemble uh, uh, um, regression matrix that considers only the vertices at the intersection between two body parts, right? So um, basically you take two body parts, you consider the vertices at the interface, and then you predict the center from this um, interface vertices, and then you regularize this matrix to use the only those vertices to predict the joint. This is important to guarantee that the joints are not 
being pushed out of the body or other weird things happen. Right? So these kind of regularizations are um, very useful to make the model converge faster and to require less training data. Again, the more constraints or manually imposed constraints like this one you, you impose, the more you're biasing your model, right? And the more data you, you have, the less you need to do this. Um, but in but in, in practice, it's useful to set up a little bit of constraints in order to make the learning um, well behaved. All right, so now we have the post contribution. We've seen how to model post blend shapes as a linear function of rotation matrix elements. Now, how do we add the shape space? So the shape space will be essentially like, again, a linear combination of shape blend shapes which will be obtained by doing PCA on, um, on a bunch of shapes in a rest pose. So basically you have like this um, SJs are gonna be eigenvectors, right? Which are gonna tell us the directions of most variation um, in the shape space, right? Once we factored out the pose, that's really important. You have to factor out the pose and then you can do PCA on this vertex, on these meshes, right? In the same pose, to obtain this um, shape blend shapes SJ, right? And now the betas are going to be the PCA components, right? That, that regulate these eigenvectors, right? That's what the betas are. Okay, so it's useful to look at how a particular vertex in the simple model is transformed to understand um, that it's it's truly a almost linear model. And I say almost, you will understand why. So essentially you start with some vertices in the rest pose, Ti, bar, is bar means in the rest pose. Then you apply like a set of pose blend shapes. This is like these displacements that you apply to account for pose dependent effects, which are, I didn't mention this, but th those effects are due to artifacts of linear blend skinning, but also for example, like effects like, for example, my muscle bulging when I flex my arm. And then we have the shape blend shapes, which model different identities, right? Different body shapes. So all this is applied on this canonical space, all right? And finally, I apply the articulation, which is standard skinning, which is this linear combination of joint transformation matrices. Yeah? So this part is fully linear. This part is not linear in pose because you have this exponential map here and this linear combination of transformation matrices and the kinematic chain and so on. But um, but other than that, other than, other than the articulation, this is a, a, a linear model. All right, so, and this requires specifying these joint locations. And we will see in the next lecture that this alternative formulations that do not require to specify the skeleton of the body. Right. This is based on um, deforming triangles directly. So it's essentially an additive model. OK, so now we've seen how we parameterize skinning with pose and shape. And now find, we've defined what is the mathematical model, but we haven't really, like, I haven't really told you how we're going to learn all those parameters from data. So it's important to distinguish what are what I call parameters and what are hyperparameters. Parameters are what controls the model, and hyperparameters are all these parameters that also control the model, but you're at test time, right? You were not going to deal with these parameters mostly. We're not going to change them. They are going to be fixed. The input parameters are our design choice parameters, which are the pose and the shape. And these hyperparameters or model parameters are the template, which is the average shape, the shape blend shape matrix, which is a matrix of eigenvectors, the post blend shape matrix, which is this um, like matrix where every column corresponds to one displacement field that will be multiplied by each entry of the rotation matrices. Then we have the blend weight matrix, which determines the soft segmentation of the body into parts. And then we have the joint regressor matrix, which regresses the joints as a function of the vertices of the mesh. Okay, so how do we proceed? What are we gonna do with this? How do we set all these parameters? 
Well, of course we need data. And um, so essentially you need data of multiple poses. And for this, to train simple, a multi-pose database was used of 20 males, 24 females, with um, containing 1,800 registrations. And to model the shape space, you need lots of people. Again, very important, all in the same exact pose. It's not that people were scanned in the exact same pose. That's not possible. People move, right? People will have different ways of striking an A pose, for example. You have to factorize out within your training model. You need to factorize out the pose. You need to do the so-called unposing. All right, so the formulation will look some a little bit like this is a gross simplification of what the formulation for training simple is, but um, grossly you need to find the hyperparameters W. These are all these hyperparameters that define the model such that my model, right? For every training registration J, you need to register the data. I didn't mention that. You need to register the data because before you register the data, it's very difficult um, to factorize vertices into pose and shape and to learn all these regressors, templates and vectors and so on. This all requires registration because this is all based on linear algebra. And if you don't have registration, you don't have ordering. If you don't have ordering, you don't have vectors, you don't have anything, right? You cannot use the tools of linear algebra. So the first thing you need to do is to register the data. And um, now let's assume that we have registered the data which is a very non-trivial problem by itself, especially if you don't have a model. But let's assume that you have these registrations. Now, the optimization requires to find the hyperparameters W such that the model M, right? Um, oh, here I'm missing theta J and beta J. The model for this pose and shape for this registration um, matches my data. Right? And this summation goes over all the registrations that I have in my training. Right? So essentially, what you need to actually do is the following. You need to minimize over all these hyperparameters, which are the parameters of interest. But to do this, I need to find what is the pose and what is the shape for every single registration. So we need to find the minimum here over pose and shape that basically minimizes the distance between the model, which outputs vertices, and the registrations, which are the VJs, OK? So that's ideally what you want to solve. So when you have like a, a training problem or, or an optimization problem, I always like to write the objective you want to minimize and then see if you can minimize that objective. And if you cannot, then start like you know breaking it into parts. Maybe you can optimize some blocks, some other blocks, but it's always good to have in mind what is the target, right? What's the goal? What's the, the ideal objective function you would like to optimize? Yeah. Um, all right, so we could just um, do gradient-based optimization um, and, tr and try to find all these parameters, but that's gonna be very tricky. We have a mean here, which is gonna make things um, I'm tricky and there's a lot of interdependencies, so this can easily go um, wrong. But if you're careful, you can train the model. So being careful means like, for example, like you want to train the post blend chips, the blend weights and the joint regression matrix from the multi-pose data set, the data set that exhibits different poses. You want to regularize the Post blend shapes, this is the post blend shape matrix. You want to regularize them towards zero with rich regression. Um, the reason for this is that you don't want like very large contributions um, on the template mesh because this might create some artifacts and might produce um, some weird artifacts for new poses not seen during training. You might um, regularize the blend weights towards some initialization, which might be provided by an animator. This is the case of um, Simple, like Simple was not built completely from scratch, but basically um, there was a template that had some blend weights sculpted by an animator and essentially like um, Simple regularizes towards this initial um, animator set 
blend weights. And you want the joint regressor matrix to be regularized towards part boundary centers and is forced to be sparse. This is what I was describing before. And um, the mean shape and the eigenvectors matrix as the blend shapes for the shape are learned from the multi-shape data set. And you need to be a bit careful. You have to train first some parameters for the pose, and then you have to um, find the uh, shape space. And then maybe you want to iterate this process a couple of times. So in total, you have like about, um, if you do the numbers, you have about 6 million parameters, which is um, for a body model. I mean, it, this is a lot. I mean, it's nothing compared to large um, deep learning models, but still it's a lot of parameters. Um, of course, you, you would never set those parameters manually, but basically um, you learn those parameters and then they are fixed, right? And sure, they take some memory, but apart from this, they are fixed. And then you can um, use the model with the pose and the shape. So, okay. So basically, um, once the pose blend chips and the blend weights and the joint regressor have been optimized, the template and the shape blend chips are obtained as follows. You set all the registrations into a canonical pose, like what you can see here. And then basically every shape is a vector in this matrix entry. Okay. And now you just do PCA. You basically write this matrix as um, the average T where every entry, every column is the average for that particular, um, sorry, this is just the average over the data set. And then um, we add this matrix where every column is an eigenvector, okay? And um, this multiplies this matrix of coefficients to obtain the original subject, okay? So we're compressing the information because this is gonna be fixed and then we're gonna just fiddle with these beta parameters um, to represent different identities, right? So T is the average of shapes. These are the eigenvectors and um, exactly. So we're gonna like um, discard like these um, like higher, like the higher eigenvectors because we're gonna see that a few eigenvectors are sufficient to represent the space of body shapes because they will cover enough variance you know, in my distribution. Um, all right, so let's look at these eigenvectors. Um, so here we would look at the bottom. We're indicating which principal component we're varying and notice how, um, let's play this again. Notice how the first component mostly changes the scale of the person. The second component changes um, a little bit the weight and then other components change um, other subtle details. And there is one model that is trained for, for the male part and one model that is learned for the female part. There's also models that are um, learning the female and male model together, but that's essentially not, uh, not a good idea because if you plot the distribution of, of components, you, you clearly see two modes for the male and the female. So it's always a good idea to learn a model for males and a model for females. Um, this is the female model, and you can see here on the uh, this canonical pose, the effect of the pose blend shapes. Notice how they are a set of displacements that are applied to this canonical shape such that when the pose is applied, then the mesh looks realistic. Okay, so this is a vertex-based model. And um, basically the key ingredients are that you apply 3D displacements plus an articulated um, kinematic chain. And it's, it's applied to vertices directly. There's explicit centers of rotation. And this is like um, what the simple model is based on. Is that the only way of building a body model? No, there's other ways. For example, like um, a very popular model before simple was scape which worked actually very well. And it was based on um, what are called deformation gradients. So this means like you deform not rotating vertices along joints, but you deform every vertex of the mesh 
independently, and then you stitch the pieces together. And that's the basic idea. If we have time, we'll cover a little bit of this deformation gradients and how scape works. I think it's very um, instructive to know what was there before. So the interesting thing is because you basically transform every triangle in the mesh independently, you have no center of rotation, um, which perhaps might be an advantage, um, but it's definitely less intuitive and less compatible with a lot of standard packages. So you might wonder like how this compares to previous models and um, essentially in terms of realism, it looks similar, um, but now the model is much simpler and um, more importantly, you, um, well, let's, let's first look at how it generalizes over um, um, no, how no, let's look first at how expressive the shape space is. So what you can see here is um, like, like the pose generalization residual. So basically you, you hold out some data for, for poses you have not seen during training and you compare models for a different number of shape coefficients allowed, right? The more shape coefficients, the better you will be able to explain the, um, the left out data. And so you can look at the mean absolute error and you can see here, um, this is the simple model and you can see um, like here the blue line, right? Which is like fitting the registrations better than the Blendscape model, which is slightly above. The improvement is not, is not huge, um, but, but it's significant, right? Um, and uh, and one reason is that like the Blendscape model has this teaching step, which might, you know, modify the pose. It's more difficult to really nail a particular pose. Um, but the big advantage is not this. The big advantage is how expressive the shape space is. And this is um, seen by the cumulative uh, variance. So you can plot how much variance a given number of components um, explain. And um, you can see that if you use this, um, what I was calling like deformation gradients or deformations on triangles, and then you do PCA on that, you're going to need a lot of components in order to explain um, the variance. And this is um, seen with these dotted lines here. Notice that this curve goes very slowly up, as you can see here. So you need like sometimes like as much as 300 components in order to cover like about 90% of the variance. And with simple, like with the interesting part is that with a few components, you already capture a lot of the variance. And this is because it's a, basically you do PCA on vertices, on vertex displacements, and um, this matches better like this, um, uh, yeah, it, it matches better like this, this variance that you want to capture, right? This doing PCA in the right space. Okay, so um, in conclusion, we have that um, Simple has become, since its publication, very popular in both academia and industry. And the reason is that it's it's fast, it's easy to use, right? And it's compatible with a lot of um, packages. And uh, the truth is that most people use the Simple model, um, but they don't really know how it works internally. And um, But that's fine, right? Because then once... You have this module, you know, it works, it produces meshes given pose and shape, and then you can do more advanced things on top. Um, all right. Um, now, what do we do if we want to model other things like soft tissue, for example? Well, using these vertex-based models, you can do this easily. You can add like dynamics. You can learn a set of vertex displacements, which are a function of some parameters. Let's call it phi here, which determine the soft tissue deformations. For example, like and this, the original simple model extended a prior model, which was called Dyna, which modeled soft tissue dynamics um, with this vertex formulation. And um, yeah, the it's it's basically easy to add into the formulation. You just need to add in this template mesh, like a set of um, displacements for the soft tissue. So here I'm showing you the post blend shapes, which model this pose-dependent deformations. In the middle, I show the soft tissue deformations. And on the right, I'm showing you these um, um, animated mesh, where you can see that you have the soft tissue, which is also important for, uh, for realism.
um, here I'm showing you a comparison of the actual registration of like a person like like jumping around and um, here are the generalization results of what we call the sim the DIMPO model, which is uh, stands for dynamic um, multi-person linear model. All right, this is um, as far as I wanted to talk um, about vertex-based models. Um, hopefully most of you have already been playing with the simple model. Now you have hopefully a better understanding of, of the internals, how it works. And um, more importantly, I want you to like sort of start thinking what are the important ingredients in designing uh, a body model and like to realize how um, some design choices are important um, and, and how some design cho choices make our lives easier. It's not only about just gathering data, sometimes just having like the proper mathematical model will allow us to, um, to learn more effectively. All right, so these slides are based on the SIGGRAPH 16 tutorial, learning human bodies in motion. You might check this. Uh, I think this tutorial is really good to understand the difference between uh, between deformation gradient models like scape and, and vertex-based models like simple. Um, and then you might want to read a couple of papers like the original simple paper, um, which is listed here. You might want to read a paper which extends simple to hands. And you can see that the formulation is, is very similar, which shows that um, the formulation is generic, which is a good thing. Um, there's also like this um, two examples of um, these other kinds of body models, which are based on the formation gradients. One is Dyna, which, um, which is a SIGGRAPH uh, 15 paper. And then there's the SCAPE paper, um, Shape Completion Animation of People. Um, I forgot the year here. Um, I think this 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 is SIGGRAPH 2007 or something like that, yeah? Um, which also works very well, but you need a lot of components for, um, for describing identities of people. All right, um, that's all I wanted to discuss and I hope you enjoyed and thank you. Bye-bye.